Hey family, Pastor Jay here. Happy Sunday. I'm so excited about what's going to take place in today's service. I met this brother about five, six years ago. His name is Elder Fitz Criddle. Came here from Dallas on a mission. Man, if you've ever been in a class with Elder Fitz, the brother is so deep. Never stop studying. He has a thirst and a hunger for God's word and changing people's lives. I'm so excited about what he's going to deliver and deposit in your spirit today. Elder Fitz, do what only you could do, brother. Preach that word. God bless you. Guess what? Here he comes to stage. Elder Fitz Criddle. Preach. Black man, preach. God bless you. Now, most of us are familiar with the story of Adam and Eve. We know that God created Adam and Eve. And then he uh, put them in the Garden of Eden. Everything was wonderful. Everything was perfect. And God says, look, you can eat from any tree in the garden. But this one right here, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, do not touch this tree. Do not eat from this tree. For the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. So what do they do? They ate of the tree, and therefore sin and death has now come into the world. And then here comes God after they've eaten from the forbidden fruit. And he, he turns the Garden of Eden into a courtroom where the God, the judge of the universe, now begins to interrogate and begin to ask Adam and Eve a series of questions. Now, I love a good courtroom drama. I watch them all the time. I remember Al Pacino in the movie Injustice for All, and in his opening statement, he's just going ballistic in his opening statement. And the judge tells him, you are out of order. And he said, judge, you are out of order. You are out of order. This whole trial is out of order. Just very dramatic. And then it's one of my favorite movies, A Few Good Men. We got Tom Cruise, the attorney, right? You've got Jack Nicholson on the stand, and he says, I want the truth. What does Jack Nicholson say? Yeah. What you say? Y'all saw that movie? Yeah. You can't handle the truth. Isn't that our society today? We can't handle the truth anymore. Maybe that's why we stopped telling it. So we're going to find out how much truth you can stand today. So he asked four questions. So the first question he asked is, where are you? Who told you you were naked? Did you eat from the fruit of the tree I commanded you not to eat? And then he asked the fourth question, what is this you have done? If you read carefully through the text, he asked that question of Eve, but surely it applies to Adam. What is this that you have done? It's a question that still reverberates through the halls of time. What is this that you have done? And I often wonder, did Adam realize the ramifications of that decision? Did he know of the eternal significance of that one act of disobedience? Because the Bible tells him, he and Eve, it says, you shall surely die. Right? He didn't say all of mankind would die. He didn't say every woman, every child. He was talking to Adam and Eve. He says, you shall surely die. Did you know that, Adam? Did you know that death would pass to all mankind? And here is what Paul says in Romans chapter 5, verse 12. He says, therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, being Adam, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sin. Now, wait a minute. Now, I love a good poll question, so any of you life, life students know we always ask poll questions. So, I want to take a poll, church. 
Uh, and if you're watching online, you can also answer this question. How many people in this room was there when Adam and Eve sinned? Anybody? Anybody there? Anybody there? No. So how is it that God said that we sinned when we weren't there? I don't know if you've ever gotten that question from somebody who may not be a believer. They're not, they're not very mature in the word. And they say, why does Adam's sin apply to me? Well, it's because if you look at the Hebrew word for man, in the, it is Adam, which means mankind. Adam represented all of mankind. Whatever happened to Adam would happen to us, whether it would be good or whether it would be evil. That's the system that God set up. God has a way of setting up this principle of one or this power of one. And so Adam was the one who, who represented all of mankind. Why did God set the system up that way? I don't know, and you don't either, because God is sovereign. He is the creator of the universe. He can do whatever he wants to do. We are his creation. We are not created. We don't tell God what to do. God set certain things in motion before the world was ever began. So that's just the system that God set up. Tell your neighbor, God is sovereign. He does whatever he wants to do. He heals whoever he wants to heal. He'll deliver whoever he wants to deliver because he's God. That is the system that he set up. Now, God told Adam that he was going to surely die. Now, Adam lived 930 years. I'm trying to figure out what kind of 401k did this brother have? I need some investment tips. So I'm thinking he probably took Social Security at about, about six, 700. About, about 600 years old, he probably drawn Social Security. I don't know. But this brother lived 930 years. So obviously, death wasn't immediate. According to the foundations of Pentecostal theology, death can be broken up into three categories. The first category is spiritual death. Spiritual death is a condition in this life of alienation from God because of sin. It leads ultimately to the second death, and we'll talk about that here in a second, the permanent separation of unbelievers from God. So when Adam sinned in the garden, that relationship that he had with the Father was broken, and he became spiritually dead because death to God is separation. When a baby is born, it dies through its mother's womb. So death is just the, the separation. So Adam brought into the world spiritual death. As a matter of fact, Paul says in Ephesians, says, we were dead in our trespasses and in our sins. So that's the first category. That's the first death that Adam brought. The second one is physical death. Don't have to explain that. We all understand it. In Genesis 3.19, it says, from the dust you came and from the dust you shall return. So we all go through the physical death as well. Adam brought that because Adam wasn't meant to die. The third and the most frightening category is eternal death or the second death. Eternal death is a condition of those who are spiritually dead, who depart this earthly life, meaning you physically die without repentance of sin and without faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. You don't want to deal with the eternal death. Now, if you are a Christian and you have given your life to Christ, you have escaped eternal death. And you ought to give God a praise right now if you have given your life to Christ. That means you will not encounter that second death. Look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 8 and 9. Now, in this chapter, it's about Jesus and his judgment at the second coming. And he says, in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. This is what faces those, if you die spiritually dead, you will be eternally separated from God. That is the eternal death. 
That is the second death. Adam, what is this that you have done? This is what was ushered into the world, spiritual, physical, and for some, eternal death. Now, we often talk about, I've been made in the image and the likeness of God, and we shout and we dance. Well, there's layers to that statement, right? There's dimensions to that statement, because when God created Adam and Eve, they were perfect. They were everything God intended. They had perfect fellowship with God. They were in perfect relationship. There was no sin or death in the world. We wonder why Adam was able to name all the animals because his mind wasn't corrupt. It was pure. Adam was holy. Adam was just. Adam was righteous. Adam was 100 along with Eve. But when he sinned and sin came into the world, that image was distorted. That's what we have today. Nobody in here is 100. On a good day, you're about 30. We got some 30s. We got some 20s. We got some 10s. We got some 2 percenters. We got some .00001 in here because that image was distorted. We have no reason to brag about being an image of God because what we have came from Adam. Sin, death, moral corruption. That is what we inherited from Adam. And so here's God's full plan for the image of God. Adam and Eve were created. They were perfect. They were 100. They sinned. That image was distorted. Jesus dies on the cross for our sins. So for those who have given their life to Christ, that image of God, that image of Christ is progressively being restored. Right, because our minds have to be renewed. We have to learn to work out our soul salvation. So progressively, we grow through sanctification, and we surely but surely become more and more like God, never reaching 100. We will never reach 100 in this life. I don't care how holy you think you are, how much you pray, how much you read your Bible, we will never get to a point of 100. But when the resurrection comes... And we are raised from the dead. When corruption put on incorruption, then and only then we will reach the status of 100. And if you say, tell your neighbor, one day I'll be 100. It might not be right now. Don't judge me in this life. But because one day soon and very soon, we are going to see the king and we are going to reach the status of 100. Hallelujah. Every time my life goes crazy, I said, Lord, I thank you that I'm saved because one day I'm going to be 100. I feel like a two today, Lord, but that's okay because one day I'm going to be 100. I feel like a five today, Lord. I failed. I messed up. I screwed up. But you know what? I have this hope that at one day at Christ's return, I will be 100. To God be the glory. And if you're excited, look, I'm at a stage in my life, material things don't, I mean, I, I mean, it's great to have a new this and a new that, but whatever you have, at some point in time, somebody else gonna have it. Somebody else gonna be driving your car, somebody else gonna be living in your house, but eternal life, you can't have my eternal life. You can't have my salvation. That's the one thing that remains forever. And God says we ought to build up treasures in heaven where the moth does not eat up, amen? So the more I, the longer I live, the more I praise God for salvation. The more I praise him for being delivered and set free. So man, we still bear some image of God, but we're distorted. And we see this distortion, this moral decay. I mean, just go to one chapter over and read about Cain and Abel. Lord, what was wrong with Cain? I mean, he knew what to do, right? Abel gives an offering. God accepts it. He doesn't accept Cain. Cain gets the attitude, so the temper tantrum, just get mad. And God says, Cain, why has your countenance fallen? Why are you depressed? It says, if you do what's not well, will I not receive you? So clearly, God had given instructions on how he was to be pleased, what offering he would accept. And so, of course, he's talking to Abel, and he kills his brother. And God asked Cain two questions. Where is Abel? And Cain gets smart with God. He should have just smacked him down right then. He said, am I my brother's keeper? I'm like, who are you talking to God like that? If I'd have said that to my mama, Lord, I wouldn't be here today. I'm telling you right now, 
if I'd have got smart with my mama, I wouldn't be standing here, not upright, I might be in a coma somewhere. <laughs> and have you ever asked yourself a question, what have you done? He asked Adam and Eve that question, and he asked Cain that question, what is this you have done? Fellas, oh, we got one fella right here, thank you, Franklin. <laughs> Fellas, <laughs> have you ever gotten a child support statement in the mail, and you ask yourself, what in the world, what is this <laughs> that I have done? <laughs> Lord, what is this I have done? Now, ladies, <laughs> your mama told you not to marry that dude. Your sister told you not to marry him. Your cousin and them. Your big mama, everybody, don't marry that boy. Oh, we in love. We got this mama. Five years later, with tears streaming down your face, you, what is this that I have done? It's a question you know. This is, this is not a, a, a quick problem I'm going to get out of. This is going to cost me money. This is going to cost me time. It's going to cost me my peace, my joy. I'm going to suffer because of this if I get out of it. Because there's some things that happen in this life, it ain't no getting out of it. You got to deal with it with the rest of your life. So just ask God for grace and mercy on those areas. But there are things that we all have to ask our question at some point in our life. And, it's a, and look, you can talk to young people until you are blue in the face. They are still going to make those same mistakes. We talk to our kids and don't do this, don't do that, don't hang out with that person. And when they did it, they were like, what is this? I have done. It's an age-old question that we all have to wrestle with. And so after Adam and Eve they sin. Now their child, Cain, has committed murder. Let's look at Genesis 6, and let's see how the world has progressed. And so it says, the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart were only evil every now and then. There was only evil when I'm on vacation. Only evil in Las Vegas. Only evil on Saturday night. It was evil continually. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth. That word man in the Hebrew is Adam. And it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land. Man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens, for I am sorry that I have made them. Look at the anguish and the grief of God. Now, if you read verse 8, fortunately, God found favor with Noah. So God saved Noah and his family. And we discussed this on Tuesday at our Romans deep dive class. God always reserves a remnant. It doesn't matter how bad things go, God always keeps the people unto himself that will be obedient. There is always a remnant. No matter how dark this world gets, you may not see what's going on. We look at the news and say, this world is going to hell in a handbasket. But believe me, people, God reserves a remnant unto himself. Now, just because God preserved humanity through Noah, sin was still present. It didn't eradicate the sin problem. Because the only way to have gotten rid of sin is for everybody to have been wiped off the planet. So sin still persisted. It still survived, just like a virus. A virus doesn't care if you die. A virus doesn't care if you're sick. A virus has one sole purpose, to survive. It wants to survive in a human body. That's why it'll replicate. It'll make you sneeze. It'll make you cough. It'll make you scratch. Why? Because that virus wants to hitchhike on the particles in our body to go to the next host so that can spread. A virus just wants to survive. We see the same kind of purpose for sin and death in the world. 
So even though God preserved Noah and he saved his family, and because of that, we're here today, sin still persisted. Let's look at Psalms 14, 1 through 2. And it says, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. Now, wait a minute. Now, I know that Adam and Eve believed God existed. Cain believed that God existed. Noah believed that God existed in his family. When do we get to the point in human history where now we're saying there is no God? And there are people like that today who say that there is no God. But that's how far we have progressed. It says they are corrupt. They do abominable deeds. There is none who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven on the children of man. That word man in the Hebrew means Adam. To see if there are any who understand who seek after God. Now, this is David. This is a psalm of David. David's a Hebrew. David's Jewish. David's a king. So this is after God has chosen one man, Abram, and he calls him out of the era of the Chaldees, and God starts the Hebrew nation through one man. There's that power of one. God don't need a whole lot, but if he finds one faithful person, God can use that faithful person because there's a principle of the power of one. He raises up the Hebrew people. They go into bondage. He delivers them with miracles, with signs, with wonders, with a mighty hand. They go out into the desert. God establishes a covenant. He gives them the moral law, the civil law, the ceremonial law. He establishes a nation of people. Even though they murmured, they complained, they wanted to go back to Egypt, God still had mercy and grace. He uh, gave them a promised land. He said, look, go in and wipe out all the enemies, and I'll be with you. He said, if you do this, you'll be blessed. If you do this, you'll be cursed. He gave them explicit instructions. And then they fall into sin. The nation of Israel splits. You have the northern kingdom and you have the southern kingdom. The northern kingdom, they fall into sin, and God says, I'm going to send the Assyrians and take you captive, and they are scattered. At the time of Christ, there were more Jews outside of Palestine than there were inside. And so God had a, a pronounced judgment on them. And so there was one tribe left, and that's the tribe of Judah. So let's see what the prophet Isaiah had to say about the tribe of Judah. In Isaiah 1, 2 through 3, he says, Hear, O heavens, and get ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. Children I have reared and brought up. Listen to that intimacy, right? Because God says to Israel, they are my firstborn son. The Bible says that God tells Israel they are the apple of my eye. Now, parents, you know how you feel about your children and how they are the apple of your eye and your love and affection for them. That's the same kind of intimacy and relationship that God had for the nation of Israel. And he says, but they have rebelled against me. The ox knows its owner and the donkey its master's crib, but Israel does not know. My people do not understand. Sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, offspring of evildoers, children who deal corruptly, they have forsaken the Lord. They have despised the Holy One of Israel. They are utterly estranged. Now, when do we get to the point of despising the Lord? We go from there is no God now the God that we know is now being despised by God's own people. It was crazy for the Gentile nations. You can imagine the wickedness of those who didn't know God. But this is God's people. This is the wickedness of Judah. This is what some scholars call total depravity. Total depravity means there is nothing in man. Nothing in all of man, nothing in our mind, our will, our emotions, our desires, our attitudes, our plans that is acceptable to God. 
That is total depravity. And some scholars believe it's more partial, meaning there's, there's some good in man. But there is monumental support for total depravity, that there is nothing that we can do. We have been completely tainted with sin. Isaiah chapter 60 says, there is darkness covers the world and thick darkness the people. And so there's this cloud of darkness that man has lived in and that we operate in because of sin. And Jeremiah 17 says that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, and who can know it? Sin is so deceitful, sometimes we don't know what's even in our own heart. We don't know the sin that lies underneath our attitude underneath our decisions. And we have become so cold to the things that God has said that is sin that we go right on through life and don't think nothing about it. You have, I have never seen many people come to church who are shacking in all my life. And you say, oh no, we good. No, you're not good. That is sin. And God is not pleased. And people ignore it and they think it's good and they think they're fine, but you're not fine. That is sin, and sin brings forth death. But we have become so deceived in our heart, and we have turned to the world and allowed the world to define who we are as Christians. The world doesn't define the people of God. I said the world does not define who we are. We live according to the dictate of Scripture. We live our life that is pleasing to God. Now, if you ignore sin long enough, God will turn you over to what Paul says is a reprobate mind. Because sin has its own consequences. God ain't got to punish you necessarily. He'll let you live in sin. He'll let you have your way. Because sin has its own consequence. And so we see an example in a chapter of Luke on how you can be religious. You can serve God and you can be deceived in your own heart. Luke, 10, Luke 18 says there was a rich young ruler. And he comes to Jesus and says, how do I attain eternal life? Great question. I mean, that is a great question, right? Because we inherited death, spiritual death, physical death, eternal death. Jesus, how can I have eternal life? And he asked the right person. He asked Jesus, who better to have the answer? And Jesus says, you know the law, you know, obey your parents, don't murder, don't commit adultery. And he says something that's fascinating. He says, I've done all these since my youth. Well, excuse me, you know, you done obeyed all the law. I mean, to God be the glory. What, you want a cookie? You know, so he says, I've done all of this. And then Jesus says, there's one thing you lack. Because you, be you better be very careful what you say to the Lord because he knows your heart. He says, sell all of your goods, give to the poor, and he says, you'll have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. And the Bible says, he got all depressed. He got so sad because he had all of this wealth. He had great wealth. So here's the lesson. He said he, can, he, he followed all the commandments. Well, the first commandment is, have no other gods before me. So he had put his money and his wealth before God. But because of sin is so deceitful, he didn't see it in his heart. And Jesus just revealed to him, look, you ain't kept all the commandments. You broke the first one. Have nothing, no other gods before me. And so we see this trail of evil and wickedness. We see this progression of darkness, of evil, and we see it over and over and over again. Here's what Paul says in Romans chapter 1, this summary of what's in the heart of the unrighteous. He says they were filled with all manner of of unrighteousness. Now, church, let's read through this list. Are you ready? Read. Evil, covetousness, malice, they are full of envy, 
murder, strife, deceit, deceitfulness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents. Lord, there's more foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless, though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. And Paul has more in Ephesians when he talks about the works of the flesh. And did you notice what it said? Haters of God. So man had gotten so bad, so dark, so evil, so deceitful, that ultimately humanity became enemies of God, haters of God. Look at Romans 5.10. It says, for if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled shall we be saved by his life. But I want to focus on the part where it says we were enemies. So at one point, before we were saved, we were classified as enemies of God. That's how far we had fallen. Adam, what is this that you have done? That you have left humanity in this trail of tears, trail of wickedness and debauchery. Now, you may be wondering, well, what about Satan? Isn't the devil responsible for all evil in the world? There is a real spiritual warfare. Paul says it in Ephesians. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness, and against evil. So there is a real devil to fight. There is spiritual warfare. That is absolutely true. But let's look at James chapter 1, verse 13. It says, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil. But he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. So that tells us that most of the ills of the world is just our own desire. It's just the sin that is in us. It's just the things that we inherited from Adam, that sinful nature. We inherited that spiritual death, that physical death, that eternal death. And so we inherited that from Adam, and that's the state that man is in. But I'm so excited. There are six words in the New Testament. I said six words that brings me hope. There are six words that just give me joy. There are six words that about to turn this thing around. And that is, for God so loved the world, a world that was dark, a world that was evil, because if God did not love the world, we would have no hope, but he loved the world. And I was thinking to myself, just in my imagination, I said, they must have had a Trinitarian board meeting in heaven. You got the Father, you got the Son, you got the Holy Spirit, and it says, man, this is a mess down here. They become haters of God. They no longer believe in God. The sin is so pervasive, it's become deceptive, where you don't even know what's in your own heart. But I still love them. They're still my people. They're still my creation. But they can do nothing about the sin issue because God has set up a system that only something innocent can pay for the guilty, can die for the guilty, but we see in Scripture, there was nobody righteous. None. There was no one who was eligible to die for the, die for the guilty. And so it said, we have to take care of this ourselves. And so the Father says, it's time for us to step out of eternity into time. Jesus, your word is, has been written throughout the Old Testament. They have been prophesied about Jesus. It's time for those messianic prophecies to be fulfilled. And so as time has gone on, he decided to send his son, and he warns him, look, they're going to disobey you. They are going to reject you. They are going to come against you. But I'm going to send you behind enemy lines 
because that's the only way we can redeem man. I'm going to have to send you amidst the hatred. I'm going to send you amidst the rejection. So the father had to send his son behind enemy lines. I don't know if you've ever been behind enemy lines before. When I was about eight, nine years old, I'm in Louisiana hanging out with my cousin, and this gang came out of nowhere and surrounded me. And they had whips and chains and all kind of weapons. And I'm looking, trying to find a gap, some place where I can run to escape. But there was none. And I was stuck behind enemy lines. And I was fearful. I already saw the bones being broken. I already saw the beat down. I already saw it in the hospital if I was going to even survive it. And I was stuck by accident, minding my own business, and this gang had totally surrounded me. But God sent his son in the, behind enemy lines on purpose. He sent his son behind enemy lines to deliver you. He sent his son behind enemy lines to deliver me. So God be the glory that he went behind enemy lines on purpose. And he says, you know what, son? I'm going to send you to my nation, Israel. I'm going to send you to the Jews first. And the Bible says he came unto his own, and his own received him not. He was rejected by men. He was ridiculed by men. And yet he stayed behind enemy lines in order to fight for our salvation. He was betrayed by Judas. He was falsely accused and arrested. And he was condemned like a common criminal. But he stayed behind enemy lines to fight for our salvation. He was whipped by a cat of nine tails. And the Bible said, according to all theologian estimates, he should have died on the whipping post, but he could not die on the whipping post because if he had died on the whipping post, he would, no one would be saved from their sin. But he stayed behind enemy lines, fighting for our redemption, fighting for our justification, and he went to the cross. And the Bible says that he hung there from the sixth to the ninth hour, fighting for our justification, fighting for our right to be children of God, fighting for our adoption. And he said... Father, why hast thou forsaken me? He experienced the separation. He experienced the condemnation. Hallelujah. And he hung his head and he died. And he died until the sun refused to shine. He died until earthquake broke out all over Jerusalem. He died until the curtain in the temple was ripped from the top to the bottom. He died until dead man was seen walking all over Jerusalem. He died, he died, he died. He died until the centurion said, surely this must be the Son of God. Somebody just holler, he died, he died, he died. And he died for our sake. The Bible says, he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And now we have a whole different perspective. We don't ask Adam any more questions. He brought sin and death? Yes. He brought spiritual death? Certainly did. He brought physical death? He certainly did. But now we look to Jesus, and what is this that Jesus has done? Because now I can have spiritual life. Now I will be resurrected from the dead, and now I won't have to deal with eternal damnation. We don't look to Adam anymore. We look to what Jesus has done. There are only two options in the world. You are either under Adam's sin and death, and you would eventually experience the eternal death, or you are under Jesus, where you have forgiveness of sin and you have eternal life. If you are under Jesus, you ought to clap your hands and thank God that he has saved your soul. And just when hell started throwing a party, just when they thought they had defeated the Lord, three days later, I said three days later, he rose with all power in his hand so that a sinner like me and a sinner like you can come asking, what must I do to be saved? To God be the glory. And I have one more verse I want to look at. John 3, 35. It says, the Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. Whoever believes in him, the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son 
shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. Moses said in the book of Deuteronomy, I offer you life or death, blessings or cursings. And he says something fascinating. He says, choose life. And that's what we're here today is ask you to choose life. You know, as I was meditating on this this week, I kept asking the Lord about this service. And I kept hearing the two words, bold moves. The world is so bold today. They are in our face. They are out front doing whatever the world wants to do. And the Lord is looking for us in this place today. And if you're watching online or in this room, who is ready to make a bold move for Christ? Because you got to be bold to come to Jesus today. And so God is looking for those who are ready to make a bold choice for Jesus. So if you want to know the Jesus as your Lord and Savior, if you don't want to be under Adam's curse, if you want to come out of spiritual death, if you want to escape the wrath that is to come, if you want to escape that eternal death, then stand to your feet and we're going to say a prayer and we're going to make sure that if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, we want to make sure you have a spiritual, uh, experience, a spiritual life today. If you're watching online, put in the chat, I want Jesus. Hallelujah. So for those of you who are standing, we're going to say a prayer and repeat this prayer after me. Say, Father, in the name of Jesus, I confess I was born a sinner, born under Adam. But today, I believe in my heart that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And I receive him today as my Lord and my Savior. Lord, forgive me for all of my sins. I turn to you for salvation. Fill me, Lord, with your Holy Spirit. And I thank you. You allowed me to live, to give my life to you. Now I am your child. There's no condemnation. I am saved, delivered, set free from the wrath to come. The Lord, make me the person you have called me to be. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. Thank God for these souls that are coming to the kingdom. The angels in heaven are rejoicing. Let's stand to our feet and let's rejoice over these souls who are now children of God, these souls who are now redeemed, these souls who are now justified, these souls who are no wrath, there's no condemnation and there's no separation. To God be the glory for his saving power. Hallelujah. There's nothing more important than souls to God. There's nothing more important than souls to God. If you're giving your life to Christ today, if you're watching online and you said that prayer, the angels in heaven are rejoicing over you. <laughs> Hallelujah. To God be the glory. And I want to pray over those souls who've come to Christ today. Father, in the name of Jesus Holy Spirit, thank you. You are so awesome. You are so merciful. You are so kind. Father, I thank you right now for salvation. I thank you for those who have given their lives to you. Father, I pray you will cover and bless them in the name of Jesus. And Father, I pray you would raise them up in the admonition of the Lord. I pray right now that your favor will be upon them. Lord God, they, are, they now have power over every demonic spirit. And I pray right now that every demon that has tormented them, that they will be cast out of their life right now in the name of Jesus. They are covered in your blood. They are protected. They are are blessed in the name of Jesus. And Lord, we just give you a praise today and thank you for your saving power. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. If you still need prayer, if you're watching online, if you want to give your life to Christ, you can go to lfcc.tv forward slash pray and one of our ministers will reach out to you. Hallelujah.